Welcome to 3D Design and Print. My name is Danny K. Johnson. I am with the UVic Libraries Digital Scholarship Commons at McPherson Library. Today we're going to do a little bit of show and tell to talk about some various projects that have been done in our Digital Scholarship Commons, do a quick review of some key skills, um, and talk about some models that you can do with some of the activities, hands-on activities um, in our workshop. Um, review how to export designs in the STL format to prepare them for 3D printing and go over how to select appropriate settings for printing and how to submit your job for printing if you would like to. These are some examples of items that have been printed in the Digital Scholarship Commons. Normally, if you were attending a workshop in person with us, you'd be able to pick them up and handle them. Um, but uh, for now, you just get to look at a picture of some of them. They're very lightweight because they are barely hollow on the inside to save on materials. Um, you can print them to be almost solid, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. 3D design is a valuable skill to have, even for those who do not have an engineering background, because when combined with a 3D printer, you have the ability to design and create small custom objects or artifacts quickly and easily. It's great too, for instance, this skull that's on here is from an exhibit that was 3D scanned from our digitization department. Um, it's a historic exhibit of uh, animals that were collected in Canada. And uh, normally people wouldn't be able to handle those objects, but because they've been reproduced via 3D printing and scanning, people can pick them up and handle them in a way that uh, they wouldn't be able to normally. So it's got many different applications beyond your typical engineering projects. This is another great example. Um, this is Paige Whitehead, who graduated from UVic as a microbiology and environmental studies student. And she went to music festivals and didn't like to see all the litter all over the ground afterwards. And one of the things that she saw were glow sticks, which are plastic and filled with toxic chemicals. And she wanted to see if there was a company out there making biodegradable glow sticks and there wasn't um, nothing even recyclable. So she set out on a mission to make something that was more environmentally friendly. And she came to this very workshop that you were taking today and worked on making prototyping a cap. She wanted to make the cap to be metal and reusable. Prototyping in metal is very difficult and expensive, but doing so in 3D printing is simple and inexpensive. So this cap that you see here is one of her early iterations and was done in 3D printing. Um, one of her earliest models, she made the tube part out of refined seaweed, I believe. Um, her current model is using a recyclable vinyl and the glowing part she made from bioluminescent tablets that when added to water and shaken up glow, which is quite amazing. And this, when you're finished using, you can just dump into the soil and it is, it actually helps feed the soil. And so you can just reuse this over and over and over again and get these tablets to add to your glow stick and have a good time without creating more trash for the world and it's a wonderful project and she's won grants and awards for her work and so we played a very small part in her project and very excited to see where her and Yamila her business partner um, where they're going to go another great project um, that is from UVic is the 3d hand project Nick Dekcha from the UVic engineering department is using the remarkable capacity of 3D printers to produce low-cost prosthetic hands for amputees in Guatemala and other places. Um, while standard prosthetic hands used in Canada cost around $12,000 and up to $70,000, Dekjev leads a project that has created hands for only $200 using a 3D printer in spools of hard plastic such as PLA and uh, 
I think there's silicone tips in the fingers and they're able to provide these amazing resources to people for such a much lower cost. And I think they're up to um, forearms now too, so not just hands. So that's a great project to look up. You can design your own models. Um, there are calipers, which is something that you see here in the photo to measure the inside and outside of things. Um, this is an example of something that um, a little mic stand that came as a part of the microphone that you can borrow from the music and media desk at the library. And these little stands cost quite a bit to replace and they've been, one of them had been lost from one of the microphones that are available to borrow. And so they asked if uh, we could just print another one. So my manager, Rich, got one of them and measured it and did a sketch and used a software called Fusion 360, which is a different software um, from a more advanced workshop that we teach. Um, but just as an example of some things that you can design using 3D modeling. An overview of the process to move your idea over into a 3D project, a printed 3D project, is that you start with a model that you or someone else designed in software such as Tinkercad. So you can design it yourself or you can download it from various websites such as Thingiverse, Sketchfab, or Tinkercad as well has models that other people have designed. Then you load the software or the model into printing software. So you can do that if you have a 3D printer or you can send the model to us and we would load it into printing software such as MakerBot or Cura software. Um, and then from there, the model gets loaded with a series of different settings and that's where things like infill density and supports and all that get added so you don't have to decide that while you're designing the model that gets entered into the printing software and then once your model is finished printing then you clean it up and uh, you're off to the races so we use a type of printing called fused deposition modeling there's lots of different kinds of printing that's out there um, there's sorts that are it's like a vat of resin that gets hit with light in a certain pattern and it sort of draws the model out of this liquid um, there's types that um, put powder onto a plate and that gets hit with uh, light and it solidifies but the type that we use at the dsc is fused deposition modeling and the printing software slices the model into layers and this information gets sent to the printer and the printer prints sort of like a hot glue gun where it melts the filament down which is in a like a spool um, and it feeds it through, it melts it down, and it lays down the first layer, drops down the build plate, lays down the next layer, and it cools as each layer is laid down. And it, this process is repeated until the model is complete. So you can see here, this is one of the 3D printers that we have, and you can see the build plate, the filament is stored in the back, the spool of filament there, and you see the, the extruder, and then there's the display on the front that has the different controls. And we have here a little video to show you um, sort of the end of a little 3D printing project. And as you can see, very, very thin layers are laid down at a time. And you can almost hardly see each layer. They're so, they're millimeters thin, less than a millimeter. So when you're designing, it's important that you look around. It is a 3D object. You don't want to only look at it from one angle. This is an example of somebody who had downloaded a cell phone case that someone else had designed and they just wanted to add to it by putting their name embedded into the back of the cell phone case. Only they only looked at it from one angle and they didn't realize that the cell phone case was tilted up for some reason. 
when the original person had designed it. And when they put their name on it, they didn't see that the name was flat, but the cell phone case wasn't. And they sent it to us. And we take a look at the model from different angles to make sure everything looks okay. And we saw what was going on here. And we took the screenshot and we sent this to them. And we said, we're pretty sure this is not what you intended. And so they had to, they had to redesign it. So you wanted to make sure that you look at your model from all different angles before you uh, are ready to send it into print. So supports. One of the things that happens during the printing process when we're setting up a print in the printing software is turning on the support function. And the printing software automatically generates supports and you can set up at what angle the software will, will generate those supports. And you can see here, I'll just turn on my pointer. This is a model that was printed with supports not turned on. And as I mentioned with the printing working a lot like a hot glue gun, it was trying to print out into the air, this tail that goes out to here. And it's trying to print hot melted plastic in the air. And the hot plastic is just sort of aimlessly looping out here and just coming back through here. If this had been a larger model, it would have probably collapsed a lot more, but being that it was small, it was able to be a little bit more stable, but it just made this mess under here. And uh, this model instead was printed with supports and you can see these sort of loose structures underneath. You've got this raft under here to help adhere it to the build plate, keep it stuck on while it's printing. And then you break away these spindly support structures after the model is finished printing and is cooled. And you're left with this bottle here. And you can see the little bits underneath that might need to be sanded down if you want a, a smoother surface. And it wasn't so necessary in this model because it has sort of a, a textured exterior. But that is why supports are necessary and we turn them on. Um, at the DSC, if you are having something printed, um, the cost of supports is something that is factored into the price of the model as you're paying for the cost of the weight of the material. So a model that requires more supports will cost more. Printing orientation. So you have here a table. You have a model that if it's laid down on its side here versus standing up, you're going to see what happens with supports. This is with supports generated. As you can see, the table laid down on its top like this doesn't need any supports because none of the surfaces require um, anything to hold it up. And this setup like this required support underneath the whole table. So this is going to require a lot more material and then all the labor afterwards to break off the supports under the whole table. And then it's going to have very rough underneath to clean up afterwards. So this is something that we would, if we're setting up the print on your behalf, we would print the table like this. Some more settings to consider when you're sending a print in. You can choose the infill. So this is uh, three prints that have been printed um, with the insides exposed. This is 10% infill. This is 5% infill, and this is 20% infill. And you can see how hollow a 5% infill is versus a 10% or a 20%. And the 20% is obviously going to be significantly heavier, um, but it will have more internal strength and structure. So it's going to create a sturdier model. So when you're choosing what you want, you have to consider these things in terms of how strong do you want your model versus how much do you want to pay for it. If it's just going to be something decorative that just sits on a shelf, you may not need to have so much infill. 
if it's just going to be something that's going to be quickly prototyped just to test out a model, you can get away with very little infill just to get through to test your model. You can also see the shells here. These are the walls on the outside of the model, and these provide strength as well. Generally, two shells is sufficient for most models. Um, but if you need more strength, you can increase it. But again, this increases weight um, and printing time significantly. So these are factors to consider. Again, if this is just going to be a standard model, you can decrease the number of shells. Scale, 3D models can be scaled up or down depending on the size. You can design something in any size. If you need it to be very specific for fitting a part, you need to consider that when you're designing a model. Um, but if you're just downloading a, a decorative you know, figure, you can scale it up or down, and that'll, again, affect the weight and the size of the model, and you can scale those to 100%, 50%, that sort of thing. If you scale it to be too small, it might affect the detail and the uh, the ability for the 3D printer to handle um, very tiny parts. Layer height is good, um, is really about how much detail and smoothness on the outside of the model that you'll see. A thicker layer height will produce a faster printed model and um, a rougher outline, but it's really good for quick prototyping. A smaller layer height is better for fine details and smoother surface, but will print much slower. It doesn't, however, affect the weight of the model. In the DSC, we print in three different filaments, predominantly in PLA, which you can read a little bit more about there. Um, it's made from renewable biomass and can be broken down in some industrial composting facilities. Um, if you ever need to print with supports that dissolve instead of being broken off, um, and that can be useful with a model that has um, need supports in difficult to reach places or in areas where you don't want anything rough that needs to be sanded off. PVA is a non-toxic material that dissolves in water. Um, it does cost more than PLA supports and takes longer to print, but that is an option as well. We also have some flexible filament that is useful for in some instances, but is difficult to work with and not ideal for all models, but it is an option as well. When you get started on the activities in a few moments and you're in Tinkercad.com, you want to make sure if you've never logged into Tinkercad before, um, it's going to start you in something called tutorial mode. And you want to make sure that you get out of that because your designs won't necessarily save properly. It'll just have you in stuck in this tutorial mode. So you want to get out of it by clicking on the X here. And if you see this side pane that looks like this, you're still in tutorial mode and you want to get out of it by clicking on the Tinkercad logo in the corner here, and then create a new design by clicking on this button here. And something else to mention is that Tinkercad randomly generates file names, and they will look like this, and your file will have this name, and that can be difficult to search for on your computer because you won't necessarily remember what it is. So you can rename your project by just clicking on the name and typing in something that's a bit more memorable to you. So the different design activities that we have available are, they run from easy to a little bit more challenging. And each of the different activities have been designed with different skills in mind. So each one of them are gonna teach you different aspects of Tinkercad and teach you various things like rotating and lifting things off the build plate. So they all have something different to teach you, but um, I would recommend starting with some of the easier models and moving on to the challenging ones. So there is a keychain um, with your name um, or someone else's or another word. There's also, this is a, um, a phone stand 
that also works on a keychain, and then you can put words into that. A chess piece and some winter ornaments. And then the most challenging one is a set of dice. So you can get started on those and work through the step-by-step -step activities. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email us and we're happy to help you.